Well, today I'm visiting Mount Olivet Cemetery in Battle Creek, Michigan. This is a smaller cemetery of only five acres. It is a Catholic cemetery and it's right across from Oak Hill Cemetery. Mount Olivet was founded in 1875. And today I'm gonna to explore the cemetery a little bit and tell you some of the stories and history of the people that are buried here. So come along. According to the St. Philip's Catholic Church website, there are five priests buried here at Mount Olivet Cemetery. All of them were notable and well-respected during the times that they served their parish. But the one with the largest monument that's virtually almost in the center of the cemetery is that of Reverend Richard J. Sadlier. So he's the one that I'm going to feature in greater detail in this video. He was born in 1860 in Detroit, Michigan and grew up as a young boy in that community. When he went to college, he spent some time in Illinois and then he later went into St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, Maryland. He was ordained as a priest in December of 1886, and after his ordination, he was appointed to the St. Vincent's Parish as an assistant priest, which is in Detroit. On September 4th, 1891, he was made pastor of St. Philip's Church in Battle Creek, and he remained there as pastor of the church until he died in 1908. In researching the history of Reverend Sadlinger, it's very interesting to read the newspapers of the time because they were primarily owned and operated by Protestants. In previous years, before the pastor had arrived on the scene here in Battle Creek, there had been somewhat of a divide between the Protestants and the Catholics. And so at the time of his passing, this is years later, he was now regarded with great respect and admiration, even by these newspapers and those that were writing about him. They stated that he was, while devoted to the tenets of his own church, he was decidedly democratic in toleration of the tenets of other churches. And besides that, he was considered to be thoroughly American. He was an advocate of Catholicism, but he believed in religious liberty. He was respected by these men because of his patriotism as a priest who regarded the Constitution of the United States as having abolished the religious tests of all kinds. He would hold that the church and the state thus separated all religions were free to practice and worship as they chose. So they wrote about Father Sadlier as having a sense of civic pride as well as of political equality and religious democracy. They described him as being first, last, and always in favor of Battle Creek, Michigan, America. So he took an interest in the financial, industrial, and intellectual and moral development of his community. So during his time as pastor, he was able to bridge a lot of gaps that had previously been in the community and create a sense of unity among all of its citizens. During his time at St. Philip's Church, through his efforts, they built the St. Philip's Convent and the St. Philip's Rectory, and he was in the process of building in addition to the church, which was partially completed when he passed away. So it was, he was quite a remarkable man who could mend a lot of fences and break bridges between faiths and create harmony in the community. And for that matter alone, he was well respected by majority of the citizens of Battle Creek during his time. To give you some insight into how respected this man was in the community. On the day of his funeral, a major blizzard hit Battle Creek. The temperatures had plummeted to almost zero. Yet, 2,000 people showed up at St. Philip's Church to attend the service, many of which could not get inside because the church was so crowded, so they waited outside in those conditions throughout the entire service. And it was a mix of both Catholic and Protestant. Over 150 priests came from three different states, Michigan, Illinois, and Ohio, 
to attend the service. While the service was going on, one of the city commissioners recruited a small army of men to shovel the entire South Avenue where they were gonna have the funeral procession take him to the cemetery. So these guys were out in the middle of the blizzard. There was no snow plows in those days. So they had to hand shovel the entire roadway from the church so that the funeral procession of 2,000 people could make it safely to Mount Olivet Cemetery. So if that doesn't tell you enough about how respected this man was, I don't know what else will. At the time of his death in 1908, he was only 47 years old. So when you visit Mount Olivet Cemetery, remember this story, especially of the day of his funeral, and you'll have a greater respect for why his monument is so prominent on the grounds of Mount Olivet Cemetery. Now let's take a look at the second largest monument at Mount Olivet Cemetery, and that is the statue over the grave of Edward Smith Ball. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1835. At an early age, his parents moved to Ohio where he attended school, and afterward in 1859, he moved to Colorado, which at the time was a very wild and unsettled country. In 1862, he met and married his wife, Miss Rose McCauley. Together, after a few years of marriage, they moved to Montana, and that was where he made his home. They were among the first settlers in Bannock City, Montana. And in 1863, the governor at the time, by the name of Edgerton, appointed him sheriff of all of Beaverhead County, which was where he was living. And it's a position that he filled with enthusiasm. He was dedicated to rid the county of the lawless characters that had overrun the region at that time. So he served as a sheriff in that county for many years. And in later years of his life, he was in the mining and smelting business. His business Business was quite successful, and in 1892, while he was traveling in Salt Lake City, he took ill. He began seeking treatment around the country, first going to Mineral Springs at St. Louis, Michigan, and then he was referred for medical aid to Battle Creek, Michigan. And while he was here, he received an operation in an attempt to resolve his cirrhosis of the liver. And in his failing health, it was too much for him and he died. They held a service for him at St. Philip's and he was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Upon his death, his heartbroken wife, along with his devoted niece, both of whom severely felt the loss, wanted to honor him with a very special monument that showed the strength of his character with which he was so noticeable in life and admired by everyone that he came in contact with. So this statue that is over his grave depicts the kindness and charitableness along with the strength with which he lived his life. The next grave site we're going to visit is that of Stephen Houlihan. He was born in 1870 and he died in 1930. He was one of five brothers that worked for the Michigan Central Railroad and he served as the Augusta Central agent for 25 years. His first wife, Julia, died at an early age in 1908. They had three children together and he was a struggling single father trying to continue working and providing for his family. So his mother came to live with him and help raise the children. She lived with them for several years until she passed away. Then his sister came and helped him with the children. During the years that he lived in Augusta, he had been a member of the school board, village council, and the township board. And eventually late in life, he remarried in 1919, Margaret Helen O'Toole. She died in 1922. She was a well-known businesswoman in the community and she had a hat business. There was many advertisements for that while Stephen worked for the railroad. So I found them to be a very interesting family impacting the area in different ways. Julia and Margaret and Stephen are buried side by side at Mount Olivet Cemetery. The next story that we're going to explore here at Mount Olivet Cemetery is that of Bartholomew Dowdle. He came to Battle Creek when he was still in his 20s and he lived here until he died in 1916. At the time of his death, he was the oldest living fireman in Battle Creek. He'd been stationed at fire station number two for many, many years and he was an expert on the steam engines. Fire station number two is still located on 145 North Washington Avenue to this day. It's a historic building that was built in 1903 and it cost the city of Battle Creek $9,100 to build back in its day. 
He retired from the fire department in 1912, and during his years with connection with the local fire department, Mr. Dowdle was recognized as a man of courage, strong will, and was a popular worker among the other men. For many years, he was the driver of the horse-drawn steamer and was a familiar figure to local citizens while piloting the big fire team through the city streets. At the time of his death, the chief of the fire department was quoted as saying, too much cannot be said in memory of Mr. Dowdle and in commemoration of his faithful work for Battle Creek during the years he spent with the fire department. We knew him as an earnest worker. The sad event that followed his death was that Mrs. Dowdle was stricken with grief and a week later she passed away. As kind of an interesting part of this story, their son, John Dowdle, was an ordained priest and is one of the five priests buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery. He presided over both of their services at St. Philip's Catholic Church. It must have been a very difficult few weeks for him, to be sure. The next story is a tragic story and I contemplated long and hard as to whether I was going to include this one or not. But history is not always filled with rainbows and sunshine, and sometimes bad things happen to innocent people. And there are lessons to be learned even in the worst tragic events that happen. So I decided to include it, so here we go. This is the story of Steve and Thomas Kovacic. Steve was 12 years old and Thomas was 10 years old. The boys were returning to their home on Hamblin Avenue from a picture show nearby. And because of a snowstorm that struck, they decided to take a shortcut across a railroad bridge. When they were near the center of a bridge, a freight train forced them to walk on the other tracks, just as a fast eastbound Wolverine train bore down on them. Unable to escape, the two boys were hurled off the trestle into a snowbank and were killed instantly. It took them several hours for the police to identify who the victims were, and they finally were able to contact their father and give him the sad news. The boys are buried with the same common headstone at Mount Olivet Cemetery. From the period of January 16th, 1919 until December 5th, 1933, it was the time of Prohibition. So during the era of Prohibition, you had moonshiners and Battle Creek, like many other cities across the country, had their fair share of moonshiners. In May of 1923, when Franz Obraz was at the corner pool hall, believed to be taking orders for his next day's supply of moonshine, he returned home to find that his home had been raided by police and his still had been broken up. Later that month, Frank Obraz, Franz is how it's spelt on his tombstone, pled guilty in the circuit court of Judge Walter H. North. You might remember him from my previous videos. So Mr. Obraz was sentenced to 60 days in the Detroit House of Correction and had to pay a fine of $100. In 1927, he was again arrested and charged with violation of the liquor laws. Franz Obraz was born in Croatia. There was little information as to how he came to live in Battle Creek. At the time of his death in 1930, he had been an employee of the city of Battle Creek and he had taken ill and was convalescing in his bed. His wife stepped out to the grocery store and during her absence he apparently got up, tried to get out of bed, fell down and hit his head and died from the injury. He was just 35 years old. Prohibition was repealed three years later and you gotta kind of feel bad for Mr. Obraz. If he'd just hung on a little bit longer he would have been able to have that drink with nobody bothering him. In 1881, the Advance Fresher Company was formed here in Battle Creek, Michigan. Over the years, the plant grew to 57,000 square feet and had the capacity working 10 hours a day for 11 months to make 1,000 engines, 1,800 separators, and 1,500 straw stackers, among a bunch of other equipment for farming annually. It employed a lot of people here in Battle Creek over the years. In 1911, the M. Rumley Company bought Advance, and then in 1912, Rumley took over American Able Engine and Thresher Company Limited. Rumley then went into receivership in 1915. Rumley over the years made a lot of different equipment, and in a short amount of time, they made two major acquisitions. It doesn't appear like they were ready for it, 
The impact of Battle Creek was that a lot of people here in Battle Creek lost their jobs during this transition. All of this is preamble to the next story that we're going to visit here at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Nikolai Annabelle was just 39 years old when he lost his job at the M. Rumley Company here in Battle Creek in 1913. He was an Eastern immigrant. I wasn't able to identify what country he came from, but he went from earning five to seven dollars an hour, this was in 1913, to having to take a job at the steam pump company where he earned two dollars an hour. After a while on the second job, realizing he wasn't going to make the money that he was before, he began to panic. He came home and had an argument with his wife about moving to Texas. She disagreed. He fought with her, pulled a gun, and shot her. Witnesses and the subsequent police investigation believe that he didn't intend to shoot her. He shot her by accident and then turned the gun on himself. The first time he misfires trying to shoot himself in the head, his daughter ran upstairs and witnessed him put the gun to his head a second time and the gun fired into his temple and he collapsed back against a trunk, which is where the officers found him when they arrived. The court case that followed determined that he had committed suicide. His wife had originally was believed she wouldn't survive, but she ultimately did. The children testified in court as to what happened, and Nikolai Annabelle was laid to rest at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Moving on to a more positive story, let's visit the grave of Victor Schoeder. Victor was one of four brothers that got together and formed their own grocery store here in Battle Creek, Michigan. They formed it in the late 1800s and Victor worked in the grocery store up until he died in 1915. They were pretty active in the community. They always competed for discounts with other stores. And one of the more interesting facts is the Schroeder Brothers grocery store were also competitive bowlers. So there's several postings in the newspaper from 1915 where the brothers were competing in the local bowling tournaments. So it's kind of an interesting story. They were connected to the community and just every bit of information I was able to find on them was that they were good business people in the community and just living a happy life. Michael Sharkey was a saloon owner in Battle Creek. He'd been a saloon owner for 14 years from 1894 to 1908. In late 1908, the local police department conducted a sting on local saloons and establishments that sold liquor. It was illegal to sell liquor on an election day in the state of Michigan. So they came in on an election day into the local saloons and basically asked to buy a drink. If they were given a drink, they wrote their name down of the saloon owner and they came back later and served them with a warrant or served them with some kind of citation where they had to appear in court and face fines. Michael Sharkey was given one of these and at first he was puzzled because he'd never violated the liquor laws in his the history of his bar and uh, suddenly he was under attack. So he was really puzzled and then eventually when his hearing came up he heard the case against him and he pled guilty figuring he would pay the fine and when it came up for the final time before the judge to determine his sentence he reversed his decision and told the former in that at the time he looked back at his calendar and discovered that he wasn't even in the saloon at the time that this happened he was off sick the day of the election so hearing his new plea of not guilty and his reason for the, such a change in his plea judge north who i've mentioned in this video earlier and i've covered in my oak hill cemetery videos believed him after the police could not identify michael sharkey as the one that they had bought the liquor from so the judge uh, let him go with a 35 dollar fine and 15 dollars in court costs and that was the end of it about a year later there's an article in the newspaper referring to michael sharkey as a former saloon owner he apparently had sold his saloon by that time and had opened up a soda shop downtown. From there, a few years later, he closed that business and joined the Grand Trunk Railroad. So he gave up the saloon business. I guess he got tired of all of it. There was a lot of history in his saloon of people robbing him and there's other stories where he had to appear before the court and testify that they get some 
patron had broken up the mirrors in his place and caused a ruckus. Another case where someone had uh, passed forged checks on in his establishment. So he got tired of the saloon business, moved on to the soda fountain business, and then eventually worked for the Grand Trunk Railroad. And he died in 1911 while at work, working for the Grand Trunk Railroad. Miles Ward was a Spanish American War veteran. He was born in Ireland on July 4th, 1852, when his family moved to the United States, settling in New York City when he was a young boy. He entered the Willits Military Academy on Governor's Island in New York City. A few years later, he moved to Battle Creek and was very interested in military affairs and was one of the organizers of Company D at the Michigan National Guard, seven years before the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. He was drill sergeant of the company until it was made part of the 32nd Michigan Infantry Volunteers, being commissioned as a first lieutenant at the time. Lieutenant Ward was with Company D while it was stationed at Island Lake in Tampa, Florida during the war. After a number of years of military service, Mr. Ward retired from the Army to take up engineering, and in partnership with uh, Captain Fred Hinman, he supervised constructions of dams over the Wisconsin River for eight years, and later became associated with the Peerless Portland Cement Company at Union City, and he remained there until his retirement. The mass for his service was held at St. Philip's Catholic Church, and there was also a military service jointly held at Funston Camp No. 30 in his honor. And there was a firing squad and buglers playing taps at his grave when he was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery. So in the final story on today's tour of Mount Olivet Cemetery, we're gonna look at an unsolved murder from 1917. Giuseppe Elio was born in Sicily near Terracini, a son of Antonio Elio and Caterina Parisi. He immigrated to the U.S. with his wife Mary and a daughter Catherine in 1909, and he lived in Battle Creek, Michigan. He was a stoker at the gas plant, which meant he shoveled coals into the furnaces there. Joseph Elio was walking home with a friend from his work at the gas company one evening in September. And Joseph turned to his friend and said he had to go and meet some man. His other friend thought maybe he had a bottle that he didn't want to share with him to go have a drink by himself. So he left him and they parted ways. He was found the next morning lying near the mill pond at the end of South Avenue, not far from a cemetery where he is buried today. It was described as a ghastly murder where he had died from several blows from an axe. And the police determined that he had not been murdered where his body was found. They say in the report that two men had to be in on the crime and carried the body to the spot where it was found. This theory is based upon the fact that the man was laid on his back with his feet together and also because one arm was laid across the body and the other at the side. The most convincing evidence of this is that the grass or weeds around the head were not matted, nor were there any signs of a scuffle. So Joseph's murder was never solved, and he was the father of four children, and it remains a mystery in Battle Creek to this day. The Battle Creek newspapers of the time did not know how to properly spell a Elo, so they translated his name to Joseph Ellen in the stories they wrote about the murder. In doing the research for this video, it's clear that from 1875, when Mount Olivet Cemetery was founded, to the mid-1930s, many of the arrivals to the Battle Creek area of the Catholic faith were from European countries. Their stories are a crosshatch of a determined entrepreneurial spirit combined with hard work, dedication, often through harsh conditions and difficult struggles, sewn together with the threads of success and sometimes tragedy. Perhaps what best describes their endurance during those times was their common unity in their religious faith and their strong sense of community with each other. Well, that's going to do it for today's journey through Mount Olivet Cemetery here in Battle Creek, Michigan. I hope you enjoy this look into the lives of some of the history of this place 
and the people that helped shape Battle Creek. If you enjoyed watching the video, please give it a like. Leave me a comment, tell me what you thought. Give me some suggestions for future videos and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you next time. Thanks for coming along with me and watching.